working, please be seated. Open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter uh, 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. You've gone through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, and then 1st Timothy. 1st Timothy gets lost in my Bible. And so sometimes I have to count my way all the way through to find it. Uh, 1st Timothy chapter 4. And um, for our text this evening, we'll just begin by reading verses 6 through 9. And then we'll work our way into our context. And uh, we'll look at our context and make some uh, good application. All right, so 1st Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. We'll pray, and then we'll look to the Word. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for a Bible that not only uh, Lord is absolutely inspired and always true, but Lord, thank you for the warmth of the Scripture and for the sound, practical wisdom that we find in it that helps us to know how to live. Lord, practically speaking, I ask that you would help us as a church to be very conscientious about the requirements for a church and for a preacher that we find in this letter to Timothy. And Father, we thank you so much for interceding in our lives on our behalf. Lord, we recognize when we were out without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And we thank you for Jesus dying for us. Lord, I ask that you would privilege us tonight by bringing the Scripture to life, making it alive to us. Father, by uh, using it to show us our hearts in light of itself. And Lord, I just ask that you would have your way in the preaching tonight and be pleased by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul shares with Timothy a great truth. He said, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And so he talks about the office of the bishop. It's a pastor. In the scripture, you'll find that the word for elder or presbyteros, the presbytery, or uh, the bishop or the pastor, they're used interchangeably. They would be the same individual referred to uh, on the basis of the roles that that word uh, had to do with the office, but it's the office of the pastor. And uh, now chapter 4, if you will, is what we call an inclusio, the verses that we just read. It would be like, the, like bookends on, on your shelf or on your desk. If on your desk you were to have some books and you were to have book hints, if my desk has book piles or paper piles or whatever, and my sweet wife uh, makes me look respectable on a pretty frequent basis by just clearing them off. But if you were to have books and you were to have book ends. In other words, this is the beginning of the information, grammatically speaking, the material we're going to look at, and that's the, the first book in. So it's almost like an A to a Z on a library shelf, and you're going to have a book, uh, or a book in on this side and book in on that on that side. And so there was a statement that was made, and that was about a faithful saying. If you look at verse one of chapter three, the scripture says, "This is a true saying." And then if you look at uh, chapter 4 and verse 9, there's a, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. In other words, similar statements to show that all the material in between the two belongs in the same topic. So everything from when we started, this is a faithful saying, uh, or this is a true saying, to uh, this is a faithful saying, have to do with the office of the pastor and the office of the pastor in the church. So look for things like that when you're studying the Bible, and sometimes it helps you find your context, find out what's being talked about. You never want to take the Scripture out of context. You always want to find exactly what God is saying because the Bible's written and meant to be understood. And so strange doctrine comes when you lift 
Scripture from its context and place it into another context. So now, uh, we saw in the last couple of weeks, we saw the requirements for a pastor. And we're not going to go over that again this evening because uh, we didn't have enough time to preach it the first time we did. And we sure couldn't uh, even cover an overview of it without taking too much time this evening. But there's a warning in the middle of this. this these are the requirements or this is the description of a pastor and the requirements for a pastor. So verse, chapter 4 and verse 1, they notice the capital S, Spirit. Now, the Spirit. Now, when we see a word like this, of course, when you see capital S, Spirit, we recognize it's the Spirit of God. So, God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, this indicates several things that are important for us this evening. First of all, the Apostle Paul recognizes that this is not merely a personal letter between himself and Timothy. He's not just writing a letter saying, hey, Timothy, how are you doing? This is just between you and I. Paul says God's Spirit is speaking expressly or specifically or on purpose or very, very plainly. And so Paul realizes as he pens these words that it is not him that is the author. He himself has not authored these truths that have to do with the offices in the church. God's Spirit is speaking through him. And so he understands the weight or the gravity of what he's saying. Now, it's a whole different thing, wouldn't you say? Uh, the whole big difference between saying Paul says and God says. See, if you come to me and you say, Pastor Price, uh, your wife says. Well, that carries with it quite a bit of weight. Uh, it uh, carries with it a great deal of importance for me, my wife says. But now, if you were to come to me and you were to say, Thus saith the Lord, God says. If you are actually speaking for God, there's a great difference in authority there. Do you see what we're saying? And so I cannot help but pass, I can't just pass over, gloss over the fact that there's authority in what is being said now. This is not simply uh, some material for you to consider or something for you to think about. It literally is God's opinion on this is. God's Spirit says, you see that? Isn't that exciting? Aren't you glad to know that God doesn't say, figure out what I think? But he says, this is what I say. Well, what's he say? Let's listen. Says, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, now, there is a statement here that helps to explain some things uh, and uh, helps us to understand some things here. Okay, in the latter days, when are the latter days? End times, when are the end times? Now, right? The last days are now. Uh, the latter days is referring to the time in which we wait for Jesus Christ to come and to take up his saints. Okay, we're waiting on the Lord Jesus. We're saying, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We're looking skyward, looking toward heaven. And our prayer is, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So the last days is a reference to today. We've been living in the last days for about 2,000 years. Uh, Paul wrote, and so people say, oh, they're last days, you know, signs of the times. Well, friend, that's what they thought in the first century church. And I don't mean to be skeptical at all because I believe we're living in the last days. And I do realize that we are 2,000 years nearer to the last day uh, than we were at that time. But I just want us to understand things in context this evening. And the Bible says that in the last days, in other words, for the last 2,000 years, historically speaking, for us, the Bible says, the Spirit says, that there's going to, there are going to come individuals, the Bible calls them, uh, that, that depart from the faith. Now, let's do justice to the Word of God. What is an individual that departs from the faith? What was he to begin with? Really? Okay, how much faith does a non-believer have? If a person is in the faith... They had to have some degree of faith, right? I'm not trying to argue. I'm not. I always ask these trick questions, don't I? Yeah. It's like if I answer, I know I'm going to be wrong. I'm very sorry. I apologize, um, but it's a little bit funny. Anyway, so uh, in, uh, in in other words, and if an individual departs from the faith, he's left a place where he actually was. I want to just challenge you to study something because it's a challenge about a lot of things we think in our minds. Because rather than accept that God is in control. And he knows all the answers about who's saved and who's not. And, and he's not up in heaven wringing his hands, wondering, you know, is this person a true believer or not? Um, one of the things that is a dangerous doctrine uh, that's taught in the church today is that a person cannot go off doctrinally and be saved. And the fact of the matter is that the warning to false teachers is more often than not to those who are of the faith. 
than to those who are not of the faith. Incidentally, that's why there's a warning here for you not to give heed to seducing spirits. So let me ask you a question. As God knows your heart, as you know your heart, are you in the faith or not of the faith? Then the second follow-through question is, have you ever been wrong doctrinally and found yourself to be corrected by the Word of God? And the answer is, if you were ever uh, had departed doctrinally and gotten off somewhere, the question you have to ask is whether or not you're saved. And then the, the real question, and I just want to deal with this just very briefly here. I don't want to split hairs or anything like that, but it is important for us to understand. The question is, how do you know if somebody's of the faith or not? Well, the question is, what is required for salvation? You need to know what is required for salvation. You know what's required for salvation in the blood of Jesus Christ and a person's receiving it. Mm -hmm. See, my friend, Jesus died on the cross not for his sins, but for ours. Not for sins that he committed, but for ours. He was God's perfect son. He was born of a virgin. You, you need to believe that, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. You need to believe that he died for sin that was not his own. You need to believe that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But if an individual has met the requirements for salvation, that is, they've called on the Lord Jesus Christ and they've asked God to save them because of what Jesus did when he died for their sins, then that person is of the faith. Okay? So I just submit to you this evening, we're not talking about somebody that pretended to call on the name of the Lord Jesus. This scripture doesn't qualify that. And by the way, Paul was intelligent enough to pen that. God's Spirit was intelligent enough to be specific about that. So I would just submit to you then this evening that there is a secondary warning in this text, and that is to watch out for false doctrine, not just for false teachers, but for your false doctrine. You watch out that you get in the Word of God and you rightly divide the Word of truth. You make sure when you approach the Scripture, it's not on the basis of a bias because of something that you want to do and be able to justify some behavior that you want to commit and be able to say it's okay. A lot of doctrine is affected by individuals who want to do something and they want to believe they're right to do it and so they go to the Bible and they read into it that it says for them to do what they want to do. Uh, a lot of false doctrine happens as a result of a person not being willing to get right about sin. And so uh, they, they develop a theology on the basis of that. A lot of motives for false doctrine. And we need to be careful as we go to the Word of God that we are open. We just say, God, examine me with the Scripture. You look at me as I am and you show me truth. And what you show me, I will believe and I will act upon it. That's the way we need to approach the Scripture. Now, the Bible says, though, that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, so here are individuals that give heed to seducing spirits. Now, this is a small s spirit. Uh, I think that these would just be uh, spirits that are representative of different uh, fleshly desires. If you were to describe it in a particular way, in, in spirits that would seduce someone to a desire. And Christian, if you don't walk in the spirits, you will obey the lust of the flesh. And so these would be spirits that would seduce you toward the lust of the flesh. And when individuals want to sin, um, then they, they want to believe they're right many times. And that's just one of the dangers here. The Bible says doctrines of devils. And these would, I believe, be doctrines that would cause others to not receive Christ as their Savior. You know, a lot of times we think that people that are sincere are harmless because of their sincerity. You ever felt like that? You ever met somebody in a religion that caused people to believe things for which they would go to hell? I mean, listen, friend, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But yet you meet religions that say, well, that Jesus isn't the way for salvation. This is the means for salvation. And you just think, boy, those people are so sincere, and they're so devout, and they're so good, and they're so well-meaning, well-intentioned in what they believe. And you can even understand their motive. You ever feel badly for somebody who was born into a religion and would lose all of their family ties and members if they left it? How would you like to be born Muslim and examine your faith? How easy would that be to be born a Muslim? You know what happens if you leave your Muslim faith? <laughs> Beheading. I'm not joking about it. I'm serious. If your parents are at all devout, they have the uh, obligation to kill you. And they surely aren't going, to, uh, aren't going to treat you like they love you anymore or family. So if you have uh, loved ones, uh, especially if you're married, I'm telling you, you're going to lose parents. You're going to lose brothers and sisters and children. That would be tough, wouldn't it? And so could you understand why a Muslim would not want to examine whether or not his faith is true or not? But the problem with it is that they are, it's a doctrine of devils. It leads people to hell. People go to hell because they will not consider whether or not Jesus is the only way. 
for salvation. So this is an important matter. And so uh, we have to understand when somebody gives heed to doctrines of devils, it's not just a, well, you know, um, I understand why they've done what they've done. Study Hebrews sometime, the letter to the Hebrew Christians, and look at the Hebrews who had gone back into Judaism and they'd left their faith in Jesus Christ. They'd stopped assembling with the believers because of the persecution. They said, it's one thing to be persecuted by the Romans. It's one thing to be persecuted just because I'm Jewish. It's a whole other thing to be, be, be persecuted because I'm Jewish Christian and to have the people, my, kin, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, to have them persecute me as well. How would you like it for people in general to hate you because of your ethnicity? And then on top of being hated because of your ethnicity, to be hated by those who are of your ethnicity. It's kind of an alone feeling. And so many Christians said, you know what, it's just too much to be a Christian. It's too hard. We're going to go back into Judaism. <clears throat> we're saved, and but we're just going to worship like we're Jews. Well, that's a doctrine of devils because if you study Judaism, you'll find that it's not what the Old Testament teaches is the law for Israel. And we also know that we're in the church age, not in the age of Israel. So I hope that gives you a little illustration. Okay, now... Here would be individuals speaking lies in hypocrisy. And, of course, a hypocrite, of course, is someone who means something other than what they say. Uh, they're, they're pretending to be something other than what they are. And uh, many times individuals in hypocrisy speak lies. Whereas this is my motive is what they'll say, but the truth is, is that they've got another motive altogether. Uh, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. <clears throat> this is hard for us to understand sometimes. By the way, you ought to have a clean enough conscience that you don't go around... Um, understanding how somebody else can have a seared one. You know what I mean? You ever wonder how somebody could do something? You just, I just don't know how somebody could do that. Well, good. Good. That's a good state to be in. That means you've got a good conscience. When you don't understand how somebody could, uh, hey, the Bible does say, take heed wherein we stand, lest we fall. And this is our take heed passage of Scripture. But the fact of the matter is that sometimes individuals will have a conscience which is seared. Whereas you wonder, how could a person do that? Sometimes you'll see somebody do something very, very deliberately evil in the name of Christ. And you know, based upon what you know they know, that there's no possible way that they're innocent in it. You know that they know what they're doing when they do it. And it's not just accidental. They're not just mistaken. But I always usually, giving people the benefit of the doubt, I think, oh, they don't understand what they're doing. They can't possibly be doing that on purpose. And you give them the benefit of the doubt. But the fact of the matter, the Bible says... These individuals have got their conscience seared. Now, we've talked about these dangerous doctrines. We've talked about these seducing spirits. And now we're going to look specifically at what some of them are, some examples, some for instances of them. Okay, forbidding to marry. Uh, God's word says not to marry. Uh, give me a for instance. Tell me somewhere that that's done. Catholicism, the, the, the Catholic priest, forbid to marry. That's a dangerous doctrine, a seducing spirit. By the way, all false doctrine has fruit, does it not? The Bible says beware of false teachers. And when somebody teaches something that is contrary to the Scripture, it will always have a result. Doctrine always produces something based upon what it's believed. On what is believed. And uh, I hate to say it, but it is true that the forbidding to marry causes terrible sin in the church. And uh, by the way, I, I want to qualify the, the, as I make that statement. In the organization, I should probably say more. Uh, actually, because Christ doesn't recognize individuals that don't don't require Christ alone for salvation. Now, uh, so forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. This is a fad that is uh, rampant throughout Christianity today. It was in the 1980s too. I remember in the early 1980s, uh, sitting under a lot of preaching that was um, that talk that really took you and put you back under the law with regard to what we eat. Now, the specific example for this would be Seventh-day Adventist individuals who would take the Sabbath day and say that it is the same as the Lord's day. Those are individuals that read the Old Testament of the Scripture and apply it to the church instead of to Israel. If you read the New Testament of the Scripture, you'll see that the Sabbath day is not commanded uh, in the New Testament, but you'll see that the Lord's day is the day in the New Testament, and they're different. The Lord's Day is the first day of the week. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, and it is represented by the day that the Lord rested. So do a study sometime. I, I challenge you. Study the Lord's Day in the New Testament, and you'll see that it is the Lord's Day because the day that Jesus was risen, the first day of the week, Sunday, and the church has always met in recognition and celebration of the resurrection. 
I'm not going to fall into one of the fads that says, let's have church on Friday night. Well, why not, Pastor? Well, because the church has always met on the Lord's Day. It's a significant day. And uh, I'm thrilled to death, by the way, uh, that Christians have a five-day work week instead of a six-day work week or seven-day work week. And I'm going to tell you something. You better be careful about working like the heathen do. God required us. He made us so that we needed rest. And so he instituted a six-day work week. And then when Christ was risen, uh, he, uh, we, we got a new day or a new uh, day to celebrate the resurrection. And it's the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And traditionally speaking, a five-day work week is a Christian concept. Christian nations have a five-day work week. Some other nations would work less days of the week, but Christians always have a five-day work week. And then the Sabbath day is a day for rest. And the Lord's Day is a day for worship. Now, there is a difference between resting and worship. I know people that are bothered because it's so much work to worship the Lord. It's so much effort to get up in the morning and go to church. It's like, Pastor, you know, it's my day off and i got to go to church. Well, friend, for me, it's not my day off, and it's not just because I'm the pastor. It's not my day off because it's the day that I worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the day that I get up and I go to work worshiping. In other words, worship is... is is not worship if it does not cost us some sort of effort. If you feel as though on a Sunday evening that you've spent the day and you're exhausted from worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not a bad thing because it's the first work week of the day and it's our tithe. It is the first fruits of our week. We give it to the Lord. And so uh, when uh, someone would take a Sabbath day and say, hey, you know, you got to keep the Sabbath and you can't work on the Sabbath and you can't do these things. Friend, I remind you that Christ has abolished the law. He's blotted out the ordinances which were contrary to us, this Colossians says, and nailed them to his cross. And so uh, here are the individuals that would go back and say, hey, pork, hey, listen, I'm not this evening going to stand before you and say that pork is the most healthy meat. It is a good meat. It's a white meat. And, uh, you know, if you compare what a chicken does and what a pig does, their uh, chicken's not a whole lot better. Uh, if you think so, just watch a chicken sometime. They're more likely to be cannibalistic than a, than a pig is. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm just, I, okay, I, I'm, I'm joking a little bit, uh, but pork's my meat. All right, anyway. Uh, <laughs> forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. So you can't eat this meat, and you can't eat that meat, and you can't eat this meat, and that meat, and so on and so forth. And Christian, I want to tell you something. The Bible calls that specifically uh, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. That's what the scripture says. When somebody starts making a religion out of what you eat, they've made worship something besides the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a danger there. Now, uh, are we made up differently as individuals? There are things that I can eat in this room that are good for me that will make you sick and put you in the hospital. I'm serious about that. Hey, onions are good for most of us, but I know people, if they eat onions, they'll, they'll, they will choke instantly. I mean, it'll just close up all of their... Uh, I don't know what you call it. I'm thinking too hard. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, they'll, it, 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 they, they, can't eat, they can't eat the same thing. I want to tell you something. Seafood is very good for me. But shellfish is very bad for some people. And uh, so all of us have to approach those things from a practical perspective. I'm not saying all of us need to eat everything. But here's what the Bible says about that and about worshiping or making what we eat a part of our religion or a part of our worship. The Bible says, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Okay, so the Bible says these individuals forbid it. God has said it's good. And then the scripture goes on specifically to put it this way, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Okay, <clears throat> so let me ask you a question. What is good to eat? Everything God has made if you're, if you're thankful for it. Now, you <laughs> I've heard comedians joke about eating McDonald's and praying, God, you know, make this good for me. But I want to tell you something. Here's the Bible on it. I'm not, I'm not joking about that. Now, now, friend, we understand from Romans chapter 14 that if we doubt, we're damned if we eat. So if you can't do it in a good conscience, you ought to do it. In other words, you're going to pick up some rat poison and you're going to eat it and say, God, make this good for me. I seriously doubt you could do that in a good conscience. You understand what I'm saying this evening? Um, that's called suicide and God hates that. Okay, so now, 
Uh, every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Now, if you ever hear me pray for dinner, I'm just going to offer you something that's for free, but it's for your consideration. I do not preach sermons when I pray. You ever notice that? Anybody here have, ever asked me to pray and then thought, man, that wasn't very impressive? People many times say, Pastor, would you ask the blessing on our meal? I'll say, Lord, please bless this food. Amen. And that's how I pray. God, we're grateful for this food. We ask you bless it, make it good to the nourishing of our bodies. Amen. And that's my prayer. And that's based on 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm not into sermonizing during prayer. I sermonize when I preach. And so you just, if you want to get to eat before the food gets cold, ask me to pray for the meal sometime. And let me just say this, I'm not impressed when you do it either. Because you're not going to teach God anything for one thing. It's one thing to know the scripture and to ask God for what the scripture promises. But did you know that Jesus knows the whole Bible? He knows the whole word of God. And you can quote scripture till you're blue in the face to God. And he knows what you're quoting and he knows it better than you do. So if you know what God says and he knows it's... He knows what you say, then you know how to pray according to His will. So just pray according to His will. Right? God, please help me to have a pure heart. God, you say in your word about a pure heart. No. Uh, if you know what God wants, you know what His will is, then pray and ask Him for His will. You don't need to teach God anything, and it's annoying when you try to teach me uh, when you pray. I don't, I don't like when people teach lessons when they pray. I'm just, this is just, just you, if you've got a preference or conviction, this is not something that's a big deal to me. But I'm just sharing something to be helpful to you because the purpose in praying is to receive God's food with thanksgiving. And I think we should. I think it's a good testimony when we say, uh, God, I thank you for this meal. We recognize in our lives our daily bread. God has provided for me what I asked him for. God, give us this day our daily bread. And I recognize it, and I'm thankful for it. And God, I ask that you'd make it good to the nourishing of, of our body. I know I left this meat set out on the counter for three days, and so I ask that you make it so that this bacteria, I don't, I'm too cheap to throw it away, and I uh, feel like a bad steward, so I ask you to make it good to the nourishing of my body. Uh, this is the scripture for it, and friend, I, we can make jokes about it, but here, here's what the Bible commands about it, and it is true. And so this just ought to settle you about what you eat. I just say, you know what, if I receive it with thanksgiving, and if I ask the Lord's blessing on it, it's good. And so every so occasionally, you'll say, hey, let's go to McDonald's. And I'll say, okay, let's go. And I'll pray confidently, and I'll eat whatever it is that I've ordered that looked good to me at the time. And uh, so far, God has made it not kill me. So uh, <laughs> there he goes. Now here's, here's the promise for it. If you do that, it is sanctified, verse 5, by the word of God in prayer. So God is able to take something which is unholy, something which is common, or we could even use the word, if you will, profane. And God is able to take that thing and he's able to make it sanctified, set apart in a way that pleases him. It's a sacrifice or it's an offering. And it pleases God when we receive what we eat that way. Isn't that neat? Now, can you do that? Could you pray and say, God, I'm grateful for this meal? I know some people that are so rebellious and stubborn in their hearts that they don't want to acknowledge God in their food. I provided this. I'm the one that sweat. I'm the one that worked. I'm the one... And uh, I'm not going to thank God for it because I did it. Friend, you have a lot of confidence about your ability to breathe that I don't. <laughs> the fact of the matter is if you breathe today, God gave you breath and you ought to be thankful for it. And if you had work, God gave it to you and you ought to be thankful for it. And sometimes God will have to put you through something to show you just how much you're dependent on him. Now, there are a lot of people in this. I thank God for this economy we've had the last several years. For one thing, it hasn't affected me. Um, I was reading in a book, a uh, biography by Dr. Uh, Tom Malone or by his secretary or so forth about his grandfather. It was during the Great Depression, and it was uh, FDR had said that he was going to take away poverty. And uh, Dr. Tom Malone's grandfather said to his wife, he said, Honey, he says, says here the president's going to take away poverty. If he takes our poverty, we won't have anything at all. And uh, <laughs> so um, <laughs> I can certainly understand that. And, uh, and so, you know, God's always met my needs. I've always had everything that I've needed, and so I've been richly blessed in Christ Jesus. And so this economy hasn't hurt me. I think the uh, economy that's not realistic is harmful anyway. We can, and That's a political discussion, really, more than anything else. But uh, the fact of the matter is that a Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church hasn't been hurt by the economy. 
We, God's just blessed. He's just taken care of us. Always met our needs. We've always had exactly what we needed. We've always been able to do everything that God has laid in our hearts to do for ministry in our church, regardless of the cost. And I praise the Lord for that. Isn't that good? And the reason for it is because of God's blessing in our, in our lives. And uh, the fact of the matter is that many people, though, in this economy learned that they weren't as talented as they thought they were. And they weren't as qualified as they thought they were. I know people that are still without a job, been without a job for a couple of years because they can't find a job that's the kind of job they're looking for. Why? Well, they want to be paid more than they're worth. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, if you can't be productive enough to earn your pay, you're not worth that. And sometimes it's good for us to have a reality check. And I don't, I'm not putting anybody down by saying that this evening. I just think it's a reality. And it's good for us to realize that even the ability to earn the food that we put on our tables comes from God, and we ought to be thankful for it. Mm -hmm. I'd be a thankful, ought to be a grateful Christian. God hates ingratitude, and sometimes he's got to bring you through a time of testing or teaching to bring you to a place of gratitude. And so that's just practical from our text. I'm taking a while tonight, so let's move along. Then the Bible says in verse 6, and it's talking about the requirements for the pastor, requirements for the deacon, and uh, <clears throat> the requirements for uh, the mystery of godliness. And now verse uh, and then about watching out for false spirits, seducing spirits. Uh, verse 6 says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. I want to pause here and pay attention to the word minister. Again, we're looking at the if, if a man require the office of a bishop, it's a good work. Okay, what does a bishop do? Well, he ministers. What is a minister? Can I remind you this evening that a minister is not a title? Minister is not a title, it is a position. What does a minister do? He meets the needs of others. He meets the needs of others. In other words, a minister isn't looked up to, isn't reverenced. He is a servant. He serves others. He does for others what they need. And a good servant of the Lord uh, is going to put the brethren in remembrance of these things. You know, I've had to do that sometimes, practically speaking. Even in our church, I've had to say, you know what, guys, this is what the Bible says about the Sabbath day. You're getting a little off on this thing. Uh, this is what the Bible says about food and what we eat. Get a little off on these things. The Bible says about it, if you do, <clears throat> if you remind people of these things, I shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Of course, this is speaking of Timothy. And then it goes on to say, uh, be, be a little bit hard-nosed. Hard That's what verse 7 says in uh, Pastor Price's new translation. Be hard-nosed. In other words, uh, be unmoving. It says this, but refuse refuse. Uh, what that means is don't tolerate, don't put up with, do something about it. Refuse profane and old wives' fables. We've got a lot of old wives' fables in Baptist circles. A lot of statements, a lot of Christian buzzwords of things that we say that aren't so. You ever heard the, hey, he's a professor but he's not a possessor? Old wives' tale. Uh, if he isn't Lord of all, he isn't Lord at all. Oral old wives' tale. Those are ways that a person tries to determine whether or not they can see the heart of a man, and they cannot. Only God sees the heart. They would be old wives' tales. Uh, there would be individuals, well, you know, that we always say, when you, whenever somebody says they always say, what they mean is, I'm going to say something that's unbiblical, and so I've got to get some support uh, with a whole lot of people that uh, say that I'm right. And that's what that means. The Bible says refuse, profane and old wives' fables. And then the Bible says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now here's a saying, the Bible says, For bodily exercise profiteth little. Now understand the context here. This is not an anti-bodily exercise um, statement. Although I am coming to realize more and more um, the dangers of bodily exercise. Uh, I can't get in shape anymore. It's just I have been personally, <laughs> I'm just ranting here, but... <laughs> I, every time I start to get in physical shape, something in this old body gives up. It just it, it doesn't cooperate, and it, and it goes into pain mode and shuts me down. But I want to tell you something. I've got to exercise because pain mode from not exercising is getting worse. And so this is part of being geriatric and so forth. And I, <laughs> I like to throw that word around. I like it. I've been using it on my dad, and so... It's only appropriate to use it on myself. Uh, refuse, profane, and old wives' fables. Exercise thyself. Bodily exercise profiteth little. 
Now the idea here is that there's profit in bodily exercise. It's not a, you know, there's not much profit in body, bodily exercise. That's not the statement. The statement here is bodily exercise has some good in it. And the idea is a superlative. In other words, a much more superlative. That's right, right? Comparative is this is the same as. Superlative is this is more than. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure I knew that. Um, the Bible says, but godliness is profitable unto all things. And now pay attention to this promise. This is absolutely wonderful. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Can I remind you, Christian, that godliness is and has its own reward? Did you know that when you made a wise decision, you benefited from it immediately? <laughs> Ever met somebody and they just had all kinds of problems? You say, yeah, I met them. They're sitting in my seat. <laughs> uh, uh, you ever met somebody, and they had all kinds of problems, and, and every one of their problems, they and you could go back to an unwise decision they made or an ungodly decision, if you put it that way. In other words, the Bible says, if a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. But here's an individual, and they've got all kinds of problems, and a lot of times their problems are people. And the reason for it is because his ways didn't please the Lord. I don't have to remind you this morning that you can't do the wrong thing and have it work out right. God is gracious, and God forgives sin, and God restores. And God takes our evil, and he works it for his good. But our evil is still evil. This doesn't change evil into good. It's just that God takes it, and he makes it good. He works good with it. But the consequence of it, or the, or the, the practical application for it, is that when you do right... You have the benefit of righteousness. There are a few things in my life where because of the Bible and what the Word of God said and because of godly counsel in my life, I've made good choices, made right decisions. And I just want to tell you something. On a daily basis, I reap the benefits of those decisions. By problems I don't have, um, I made a decision never to touch, never to touch strong drink. The Bible says, wine's a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I have got every penny that I would have spent on alcohol invested in something else. <laughs> I don't have it. Uh, but I'm not broke today because of the alcohol that I would have consumed. don't have financial problems because of alcohol. Um, if anybody's ever watched me eat, they know that um, I have a uh, rather hearty appetite and that if I were to drink, I suppose things would be similar. And so I'm not a drunk because I've never drank. Because I believe the Bible. The Bible says, wine's a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever's deceived thereby. It's not wise. I don't, I, I've never drank. And so consequently, I'm not a drunk. So because of that, I've never beaten my wife. I've never run over a little kid uh, while I've been under the influence. And I don't have the problems that would come from that. See how practical that is? Um, I've made some decisions about being a personal soul winner. And consequently, I don't deal on a daily basis with a conscience that says, you know what, you're unwilling to suffer reproach for my name. You're unwilling to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, I, and so I'm able to sleep at night as a result of that. Godliness has profit. God blesses godliness. And so if you'll do right, friend, it, it has a blessing in this life. But can I say to you that here is a double promise? For his bodily exercise profiteth little. All right, um, I, I heard on the radio the other day something to the effect that they, it's not exactly proven because you can't really prove when somebody would die when it's not when they died. But it was talking about life expectancy, and it said that people who exercise and who don't eat too much and who something else, I don't know what the third thing was, three things, uh, maybe it was alcohol. They live an average of 12 years. I think it was smoking, though. Okay, so it's, they don't smoke. They exercise. I think it was the opposite. They actually said it the other way around. Anyways, they said they smoke, they don't exercise, and they eat too much. Said on average, those people live 12 years less than someone else. Okay, now if in this life we are living for Christ and we are gathering rewards in heaven, the Bible teaches we are. When we live for Jesus, God's pleased. And uh, he doesn't just say, hey, I, you did it because you should have. 
Well, we should have, no question about that. But he actually gives us rewards. He rewards godliness. So if a person were to live in such a way that he were to have 12 more years of earning riches and glory with Christ Jesus, laying up treasures in heaven, would that be to his benefit? Sure it would. And would it be to his benefit in this life? Perhaps if he lived 12 years longer, would his life on this earth be a little bit better? I mean, the day he died, I promise you, if he died from smoking, drinking, and uh, what was the other thing? Lack, or lack of exercise. Eating, eating, not exercising, and smoking, whatever those were. If he died, the day he died, I promise you, he wasn't the picture of health. Which means that up to that time, he didn't have the best life he could have possibly had. Right? I'm just being practical here. So if he lived 12 years beyond that, he lived much better. So there's benefit in this life and in the life to come. That's what the scripture says. And Christian, the same is true. It's never a waste of time for you to do right. It's never a waste of time for you to endeavor to be godly. And that's practical, isn't it? And that's practically encouraging. And I trust that you're encouraged by it tonight. Christian, live right, do right. You'll please the Lord Jesus. And there is not just a little, there is great profit in godliness. And so then the Bible says it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. In the end, it's faithful means it's true every time. Beginning says this is a true saying. Now it says this is a faithful saying, which means it's true faithfully. It's true over and over and over again. And it's worth accepting. Worthy of acceptation. It means it's worth not just your consideration. It is worth your while to act on it. And so that's the invitation tonight. Will you pay attention to the warnings of the scripture, give heed to them, and apply them to your life because the Bible says it's worth your while. Now, aren't you glad that this book is practical? And aren't you glad you don't have a God that says, live perfect and I'll check on you when you get there? But he tells us how to live. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so we've had a little instruction in righteousness this evening, and I hope you'll be able to live it out this week in a practical way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we're just thrilled to death that we have a Bible that we know doesn't have mistakes in it and that you preserved. And Lord, that you've written so that the common man can read it and understand it. And now, Lord, I ask that you'll remind us of these truths that we've seen this evening. Make them evident in our lives. And Lord, as we go throughout our week this week, Lord, as we eat, as we drink, Father, as, as uh, we work, and Lord, as... We endeavor to keep sound doctrine. I ask that you bring to a remembrance these verses of the scripture that we've studied and help us to be wise as a result and do the right thing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. Brother Chris, is the meeting over here?